it's caused appalling disasters. You'd see this big arc of lightning, and you'd watch that baby come right down the side of the aircraft. You knew that it was a, a terrible tragedy because the airplane was uh, in the river. Extreme weather. It's responsible for a staggering one in three air crashes. But each terrible tragedy teaches us something new. Larry, we're going down. Larry, I know it. I know it. The airline industry is constantly developing new technology to fight the problem. But when the weather gets bad, accidents still happen. Will we ever win the battle against extreme weather? Dusk, Washington, D.C. Air Florida Flight 90 waits at Washington National Airport. It's bound for Fort Lauderdale in Florida, but the weather is appalling. The airport is blanketed in up to 10 centimeters of snow, and the temperature drops to minus four. It's a time when pilots need to be particularly attentive to the hazards of snow and ice. It was snowing, it was freezing cold. David Learmount is a pilot and aviation journalist. Every time winter comes round, all the good airlines remind their pilots they must be aware of all the risks that winter throws at them. On board Flight 90, the 79 passengers and crew have been delayed for over an hour and a half by the snow and are impatient to get off. One of them is Joe Stiley. He's told his wife he'll only be away 24 hours and will then take the children on holiday. At 3.59 p.m., the Air Florida flight is given permission to take off. Flight 90 gathers speed down the runway. And as it climbs out of the airport, it suddenly goes into a stall. The aircraft has plunged into the icy waters of the Potomac River. Within seconds, only the tail is visible. Then, against all the odds, a small group of survivors bob to the surface. Ice prevents rescuers reaching the struggling figures. Then, a helicopter arrives. It's a race against time. In freezing water, a human will lose consciousness within 15 minutes. But only one person can be rescued at a time. The first to be winched to safety is business executive Bert Hamilton. He's followed by Kelly Duncan, a 22-year-old air stewardess. Miraculously, she's only suffering from minor injuries. Eventually, a rope is thrown to a third survivor. Joe Stiley has been badly injured and is desperately trying to stay afloat. I was holding on to a piece of the tail section. I held on to the rope and let him drag me out. To save time, Joe grabs another survivor. Priscilla Tirado has lost her husband and child and is in extreme distress. I tried to get the rope that they gave to us on her. But he hasn't got the strength to hold on, and she's left floundering in the icy water. Time is running out.
Then a bystander strips off and jumps in. Lenny Skutnik, in an act of extraordinary courage, pulls her to the shore. In all, five survivors are rescued from the water. A sixth man, Arland Williams, who has repeatedly passed the rescue line to others, doesn't make it. There was a, a sixth man clinging to the wreckage. And as I dropped the flotation devices, he handed these devices to the other people who were clinging around him on the wreckage. A span of the 14th Street Bridge will later be named after him. But getting people out of the river is only part of the problem. On the 14th Street Bridge itself that day, there's also chaos. One of the aircraft's wings has clipped it, overturning and crushing vehicles. Bill Hendricks will later lead the crash investigation. There were six cars just flattened out. Part of the bridge structure was gone, the bridge railing was gone. It was a, a terrible sight, and the airplane was in the river, with, uh, still with victims inside it. The accident's final death toll is 74 passengers and four people on the bridge. But the big question hanging over the whole incident is what has gone wrong. Washington that day has been hit by freezing temperatures and unusually heavy snow. But dozens of other aircraft have landed and taken off safely in identical conditions. So what makes Flight 90 the only victim of snow that evening? In the days after the accident, Divers and cranes are brought to the crash site on the Potomac River. The first task for the chief crash investigator, Bill Hendricks, is to locate and retrieve the flight data recorders. It will eventually take seven days to get both the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder ashore. It's a moment of triumph for the divers. Now at last, Hendricks can piece together what's happened. Once we got the flight recorders, it came together quite, quite clearly what the, what the cause of that accident was. The first clue is something that happens 50 minutes before takeoff. Snow has made the taxiway slippery. And the tow tugs can't pull Flight 90 back from the boarding gate. The pilot, Larry Wheaton, decides to help. OK, I'm going to try a little first thrust. He revs the aircraft's engines and then reverse. It's like putting a car into reverse. He hopes the engines will force the aircraft back from the gate. But it's a highly irregular maneuver. The reverse thrust kicks up snow and ice that is sucked into the engines. It throws stuff in front of the engine, which then gets sucked into it. So it's really something that you avoid. It can gunge up a number of the sensors, which are essential for the, um, for the aircraft's correct performance. It's a bad judgment, but it should not have caused a crash. Modern aircraft engines are equipped to deal with snow and ice. But then, Bill Hendricks finds something else. It happens during the pre-takeoff check. Air condition and pressurization. Set. Engine and the ice. Off. The crew has failed to turn on the engine's de-icing system. This is a system for heating the front edge of the engine intake, warming the incoming air. With the system switched off, any snow and ice drawn into the engine by the reverse thrust will freeze, 
interfering with the engine's performance. As Flight 90 now lumbers down the runway, the co-pilot, Roger Pettit, voices concern. The engines don't seem to be developing enough thrust. God, look at that, man. That don't seem right. But Wheaton brushes his concerns aside. Yes, it is. No, I don't think that's right. It takes the plane an extra 15 seconds and 600 meters more runway than usual to lift off. Finally, it climbs into the air. But almost immediately, it goes into a stall. Stall it! Stall it! We're falling! The warning kicks in. Pull up! Pull up! But there's nothing the pilots can do. Harry, we're going down! Harry! I know it! I know it! Piecing the evidence together, investigators can now establish how a combination of human error and extreme weather caused Flight 90 to crash. First, as snow builds up on the taxiway, Wheaton uses reverse thrust to help push back from the gate. Engine anti-ice. Second, with the engine anti-ice turned off, freezing snow and ice are drawn into the engine. This interferes with the engine's performance. As a result, when Flight 90 takes off, the engines are only producing a thrust or engine pressure ratio of 1.70. A Boeing 737 needs a thrust ratio of at least 2.04 to take off safely. The final investigation finds the pilot, Larry Wheaton, guilty of a catalogue of errors. The accident drives home the fact that when the weather gets bad, there is no margin for error. It's a problem engineers have been battling with for years. The modern fight against extreme weather goes back to the 1970s. Christmas Eve, 1971. Lancer Flight 508 is bound for the remote Peruvian town of Pachalpa. On board are 17-year-old Juliana Kopka and her mother, Maria. Her father runs a wildlife research station in the jungle, and the family plan to spend the Christmas holidays together. I was very excited and looking forward to seeing my father. I hadn't seen him for a The research station was also like a second home to me, and I was really thrilled to be spending a couple of months there. It's a busy flight. Many other people are joining family and friends for the holidays. The first 30 minutes of the journey are uneventful. Then, the plane runs into a tropical thunderstorm. Thunderbolts were flashing around us. And the plane was being thrown up and down. People were very nervous, even terrified. Then suddenly, the plane is hit by a huge bolt of lightning. Everything is thrown around. It goes through my mind like a film. Everything went very fast. The pilots fight to keep control. But the plane is breaking up. Suddenly, it 